that uh, chapter in my own. Okay. Uh, well, that's where we'll pick up this evening. Um, before we do, I just want to take a moment together um, and, and have a prayer together uh, in just a second. Um, before we do, uh, just want to let you know about a couple of things. Number one, uh, Ralph and Sue said they were needing some help moving. Um, they had a little tough time finding somebody to help them move. And on the eighth, Sunday the 18th, July 18th, uh, they need some help moving some big items out of their house. So if you're available, uh, about 3 o'clock, um, they would love to have you, uh, your help with that. Uh, they said they need some especially strong men. So I'm probably somebody other than myself, but I'll come, I'll come watch and cheer on. But uh, no, if you can help, please help them. Um, also, please remember this Sunday, we will have a VBS meeting immediately following our morning services. Just a real short, brief meeting uh, to kind of get everybody caught up where we are. Uh, so please plan to stay for that. Uh, and then uh, on our prayer list, um, Miss Helen Gibson uh, passed away yesterday. Many of y'all know Miss Helen. Um, uh, Buddy and Janine, of course, um, have been taking care of her for a little while. And, and, and she is, um, she's passed. Um, Buddy wanted me to pass along the details regarding her, her um, burial, her viewing and burial. Um, her viewing will be held Saturday at Miller's Bowl, Bowls here in Sanford on Fire Tower Road between 5 p.m. and 7 p.m. Saturday uh, between 5 and 7. And then they will have a graveside service in Willow Springs at the Pleasant Grove Church Cemetery at 2 p.m. on Sunday. Uh, so I'll give this information to Neil and he can announce it tonight and on Sunday and we'll get it in the bulletin as well. Um, of course, continue, please continue to remember all those on our prayer list. Any additional prayer requests? If you can remember uh, Lisa's uncle Roger, um, the, the doctors are suggesting more, more uh, chemotherapy and Roger's kind of hesitant, I think, toward that. So please pray for Roger and Susan. Vance, would you mind leading us in prayer? Let's pray together. Blessed dear Heavenly Father, eternal God, thank you um, so much for this day you've given us. We thank you for um, the gift that we have, um, life on this earth, your creation. We thank you for all of your creation that's around us that we get to enjoy um, every day. Dear God, we, we do pray for all those that we've mentioned um, this evening. We pray for Buddy's family as they're um, grieving the loss of, of his mother. We pray for them at this time. We pray for those who might be traveling to, to be with them. We pray that each of us can give them some, some strength during this time and they can turn to you for the, the eternal comfort that you can provide. Dear God, we pray for others that we've mentioned. We pray that each of these can, can turn to you at this time in their life. We pray for the different caregivers. We pray for the medical professionals. We pray for everyone that's attending um, to each of these um, people. Um, dear God, we pray that you bless our time together tonight. We pray that you bless our, our classes and our teachers and the time that we um, have to, to open your word and to study your truths. We pray that you will give us strength um, in, the, in the coming days. We pray that um, all things will be done um, according to your will and will be pleasing to you. Dear God, we pray that you bless everything um, that's according to your will and defeat us in things that aren't. Um, we, we thank you for all the blessings of this life, but we thank you most of all for Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, as I mentioned before, we are in Acts 23, and that's where we'll pick up this evening and continue on. Uh, thank you all so much for uh, your attention in this class and as we move forward uh, through this study. My batteries have went out. I don't have to manually do this. But uh, as we uh, have been looking at the book of Acts, we 
have now transitioned uh, from, uh, from Paul's, uh, the end of his third missionary journey to now, uh, as we left him in our last study, uh, of course he was imprisoned and, and um, <clears throat> now he will make his uh, way eventually to Rome. And that's where we're going to be looking over the coming weeks is, is uh, this journey. In our last study, we, we, we discussed um, uh, how Paul had spoke to the mob and how for a while they listened to him or attended, but then when he began to talk about the Gentile conversions and how God had, had reached out to the Gentiles as well, uh, they became upset and tried to attack him. It was at that time that the tribune uh, Claudius Lysus uh, took hold of Paul and was going to take him into the prison. He's still trying to figure out what's going on. He doesn't understand. And it's at that point that Paul appeals to his Roman citizenship and uh, because uh, the tribune thought, well, I'll beat him and I'll beat the truth out of him. Of course, Paul says, how can you do that knowing I'm a Roman citizen? So that's where we left off last week in this study. Uh, we're going to continue on into chapter 23. Uh, Paul will be given an opportunity to speak to the Sanhedrin Council. Um, and, and, uh, and that won't go so well, as you will see. Uh, the Jews then plot to kill Paul uh, again. Um, following that, uh, Paul will hear about what's going on and Paul will be uh, rescued by the tribune by sending him to uh, Felix, the governor in Caesarea, verses 23 through 35. And then we'll get into chapter 24, hopefully tonight, but if not, in the coming week. Uh, Paul will then have his, his case heard before Felix um, and Acts 24, 1 through 21. And then as we close out chapter 24, uh, Paul will be kept in custody awaiting... Uh, a trial or hearing before uh, King Agrippa, and we'll get that in chapter 26. Um, so as we begin, if you'll go ahead and go to 22, we'll actually start 22 verse 30, and uh, that's where we left off in our last study. So in Acts 22 verse 30, the text reads, but on the next day, desiring to know the real reason why he was being accused by the Jews, he unbound him, and commanded the chief priests and all the council to meet. And he brought Paul down and set him before them. So this is the Sanhedrin council. Of course, this is made up of the high priest, uh, which, uh, um, which is An um, Ananias, the high priest. And, and then, of course, the rest of the council is made up of Sadducees and Pharisees, the majority of which are Sadducees. And, um, and so they're, they're asked to come in, commanded to come in, uh, so that hopefully um, the tribune can figure out what's going on. Because he's still, he's super confused about all of this, why they're so angry, uh, what they're really wanting out of this. And so he has Paul brought in. And then we get into chapter 23. Uh, the text goes on to read, And looking intently at the council, Paul said, Brothers, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience up to this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. You are sitting to judge me according to the law, and yet contrary to the law, you ordered me to be struck. Those who stood by said, Would you revile God's high priest? And Paul said, I did not know, brothers, that he was the high priest. For it is written, You shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. Um, and so, you've got Paul. Now, one of the interesting things I think here to know is when he spoke to the mob, you may remember that Luke, um, lets us know that Paul spoke to them in Hebrew. Well, he doesn't indicate that here. I think that's interesting. I don't know really why. 
Uh, but Paul seems to speak to them in Greek. And so the tribune is able to hear exactly what Paul is saying uh, to them. Now in verse 1, Paul says, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience up to this day. Now isn't that a, that's a fascinating statement for Paul to make. Had Paul, had Paul done some things that would be seen as sinful or even evil? I mean, wasn't he the one persecuting Christians? Then how could he say, uh, I lived in all good conscience? In chapter 26 and verse 9, he'll say before King uh, Agrippa, that he, would, he was convinced that I ought to do many things in opposing the name of Jesus of Nazareth. And that's what he did. Um, he, uh, he, of course, was um, in hearty approval of the stoning of Stephen. Um, he, he was going about from house to house trying to find out Christians and to have them taken and imprisoned. Uh, you know, some of them possibly killed. How could Paul make that statement? He was ignorant. He was what? He was ignorant. Ignorant. How so? I agree. But he thought he was doing right. At the time he did them. And, and that's really what he means, right? When he says, I've lived in all good conscience, he means in the moment. Uh, you know, in, in his first writing to Timothy, chapter 1, you know, he, he says there, uh, verse 15, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, this saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am foremost. Uh, or some translations will have, I am chief. I'm chief of sinners, right? Uh, but I received mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost, I'm not being the foremost sinner, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. And so Paul says, you know, I've lived in all good conscience. That doesn't mean my conscience was always right. And this is an important lesson for us, isn't it? That sometimes we can think we're doing right and we're not. The consci our conscience is not the guide, is it? It isn't the guide. And we, we, should, we should always measure our conscience by what? The Word of God. It needs to line up with the Word of God, not the other way around. And so, um, you know, sometimes we may make statements like, you know, just do, just do what your conscience tells you to do. It's not good advice. We need to adhere to the Word of God. And so that was a lesson Paul needed to learn. And so it says... You know, when I did all those things, I did it in all good conscience. I, I thought what I was doing was right. And, and so uh, we're reminded uh, of, of the life of Paul in regard to conscience. But our conscience needs to be shaped by, uh, by the Word of God. Um, so he makes that statement. And then the high priest, Ananias, has, uh, orders him to be struck on the mouth. Um, why such a violent reaction? Why would, why would the high priest react in such a very um, extreme fashion? I mean, to slap somebody, you've got to be pretty angry at some. Well, I hope. I hope it doesn't take very little for you to strike somebody. For most of us, it takes a lot for us to want to lash out, right? What, what did Paul say that was so awful? Anybody want to take a stab at it? Yes, ma'am. The fact that he can even, he can utter out of his mouth to say that he was in good standing with God and with, with Ananias being a high priest. You know, I can imagine that rise out of him, and it's, I don't know if this is the right word to use, but it's almost like blasphemy, I would think, for him to get such an immediate, extreme response. Mm -hmm. Because what did they think about Paul? 
what did they think he, or who did they think he was? He was a blasphemer. They thought he was an evil man. At least that's what they told the people. And so uh, he orders him to be struck. And then you have an interesting conversation in verses, verse 3, or an interesting reaction of, of, of Paul, right? So what is Paul's response? What is he, what is he, so Ananias says, strike him on the mouth. And Paul says, no, I'm just telling you what, what it says. He says, what? God shall smite you. God you. You whitewashed wall. What is that? It's what? Does it recall back in your minds maybe something Jesus said to the Pharisees? Do you remember him talking about them being like a tomb, a whitewashed tomb? And he says, you know, on the outside you're all pretty, and on the inside you're full of dead men's bones. In other words, what he's saying to them, you're corrupt. And you're the worst kind of corrupt, because you put on this good face, and you seem all righteous, and you do all these holy righteous things. But inside, you're just corrupt. You're dying inside. Now, I don't know that's what Paul's alluding to, right? He just simply says, whitewash wall. I know that's one thing that Jesus said in regard to this, but, but it is definitely a, a, an, Ill, um, an allusion to the fact that they are corrupted from the within, right? On the outside, they're all nice and painted up, but on the inside, you, you, you're not what God wants you to be. You're corrupted. You're evil. Um, yeah, that's basically, it's calling them a two-faced, right? Today, is that an old phrase? I don't know, kids or younger people would say that today, but refer to somebody as, you're a two-faced, right? You're a two-faced hypocrite. And, and so that's really what he's saying to them. Um, I think an interesting question here, and one I don't know the exact answer on, is Paul sinning? It's a challenging question. So what he done, is it wrong? Now, by calling him a whitewashed tomb. And notice the response. Verse 4, he says, uh, those who stood by say, would you revile God's high priest? Paul says, I did not know, I'm paraphrasing, I didn't know he was the high priest. And then he quotes from, I believe it's from, uh, Exodus 22, verse 28, right? When, when the text tells us that you shall not revile God nor curse a ruler of your people. So he's relating back to the law of Moses when it says you're not supposed to speak evil of your, uh, the people of Israel. Now, um, I, I had one, one uh, teacher in school I respect a lot um, said this is one of the instances where Paul showed he was a man, Right? Um, that he made a mistake here and he, he shouldn't have done this. I don't know what the right answer is, to be honest with you. Now, Paul does allude to it. he made a mistake. But I do think it's interesting. Paul was a what? We've already looked at this before, but he was, before becoming a Christian, what was he? He was a Pharisee. He, he calls himself a Pharisee of Pharisees. He learned at the feet of Gamaliel, right? Be careful with opinion, but it seems odd to me that he wouldn't know who Ananias was. It seems odd to me. And there's even allusions that Paul was on the Sanhedrin council at one time. Was he or not? I don't know. That's just supposition. But I do have a tough time. Now, what is interesting, was Ananias the high priest of the people of God by the law of God? He was not the high priest appointed by the law of Moses. Who was the high priest? Huh? Jesus. Well, yeah, in Christianity, yes. But, I mean, he... This is, the, this is after the crucifixion, so the cross been nailed to the cross. Okay, yeah. good, good point. Huh? But Annas was the actual high priest. I mean, you go back and do your history, 
there, but Annas, and you go back to the crucifixion or the leading up to the crucifixion of Jesus, the actual legitimate high priest of the Jewish people was Annas, which was the father-in-law of Ananias. And, or, or uh, sorry, Caiaphas. Yeah. Let me catch myself here. I'm confusing my people. Yeah, so take back what I just said. Never mind, forget that. This may be later, this may be after, and Annas has already passed away. So sorry, forget I said all that. Whatever the situation here, and Vance is right, at this time, Jesus was the actual high priest of God's people. I do find it interesting, and Paul has been away from Judaism for a while, so maybe he doesn't know Ananias as the high priest. I don't know. And also, I'm not sure how Ananias was, um, was appointed. I don't know why I got those names confused. Sorry about that. That goes back to Caiaphas and Annas. But, um, but anyway, Paul has a very like, harsh reaction to that. And, um, and so you have this interesting reaction. Now, would there be a problem if Paul had made a mistake here? Is there a problem with the, with the Word of God? It doesn't affect the Word of God. Paul wasn't a perfect man. Go and read Romans 7. He admits the fact he was a sinner, right? Just like all of us are, and he made mistakes. Having the Holy Spirit indwell in him didn't make him perfect. I think there can be debate back and forth about whether this was wrong or right or what's going on here. That's my point to it. I don't know that we can have a firm stance one way or the other, but I don't think it affects Paul's teaching or the Word of God in any way. Because when Paul's teaching by the Holy Spirit, what's he doing? He's speaking the words of God, and that is perfect. Um, so, just want to point that out. I don't know where to fall on that line myself, actually. Um, was Ananias a whitewashed wall? Yes, that's true. That is not an untrue statement. Uh, the, the only place that there's possibly sin taking place would be in what Paul quoted in Exodus 22, or 32-22. Or, uh, sorry, 22-28. Any questions or comments about that? I know that's, I'm not really giving you a firm answer, but I just don't know the firm answer there. Was he sensitive because Paul had appealed above him? I don't know. I mean, possibly. But, I don't know. I'd think about that. Otherwise, it was his statement that caused him to come in and be struck. I think it's a statement, and I, and I think it's a show thing. Well, this is my opinion. I think Ananias sees it as a thing. I've got to strike him because if I don't, then I don't want, I want people to see Paul as, as what I, what he, what we see in mass as a hypocrite, as a, as a blasphemer. Or just because he called them brothers? No, I don't, I don't know. At, at the end of the day, though, all laws, all. Mm-hmm. I mean, so, no people are still making the transition. Mm-hmm. And it's one thing with some of the traditions that they would hold on to church was learning and transitioning to Christianity and learning what it meant. But, I mean, at this point, high priest, they're, you know. Well, and then that's uh, Vance's point. Yes, yeah, and I'm just going to reiterate it, because I think it's a good point, is that mm-hmm. from Paul's perspective, I mean, really, if you're, if you're a Christian, Done away with, 
whatever was said in Exodus and this whole you know, other piece, I mean, that's fine under the old law. And they're not under the old law any longer. Yeah, and, and Hebrews 4.16, of course, says we have a high priest. You know, and it's a reference, of course, to Jesus. Uh, when you read it, the way I was thinking about from Paul's perspective was he didn't want to offend them if they were still transitioning or if they were still living by the old laws. Which, you know, he has the background too, so he, he knows the law, so he knows how they're supposed to be living. Mm -hmm. And even if it was okay to speak against a man who has a position that he might not have, they might not see it that way stumbling block for them down the road. Mm -hmm. and, and I think it's um, I think it's interesting to look at this from the perspective of uh, the, the animosity that exists between them and Paul. Right? Or for, from them to Paul, toward Paul. And how they just hate him. There is such a hatred there. I mean, all the things we've seen, even up to now with the mob, earlier on when he was in Ephesus and they tried to kill him there, right? There's just this tremendous hatred toward Paul. And I think the, the overall point is they're not really angry at Paul, are they? What are they really angry about? Why not? I agree with all that. Because Jesus was proclaiming to be the king. Okay. Could it be that they feel guilty? Our own guilt will sometimes play on us, right? And, and, and either we face our, our own guilt or we refuse to see it and we react in anger. Right? And you see them in such a... Because we mentioned this before, words, words are words, right? Let's, you know, people talk. Why should we care if people talk, right? If we have the truth, we have the truth, right? Let the truth went out. Why do people get so angry when people talk? Let's say we were teaching a Bible class and you disagreed something really strongly with what the Bible class teacher was saying. I'm sure lots of people disagree with me at times. It's one thing to disagree. It's one thing to get angry about it. Why are you getting angry? You've been invested in that perspective for so long. And so, the truth's the truth, right? But they're so invested. It's a good word. They're invested in their religion. And so they're very angry. Um, and so you have this just really strong, vehement back and forth here. Um, He's trying to change their way of life, what they thought all their life. Yeah. And so um, you have that interaction. Any other thoughts, comments from the phone? Even more so, right? So I, I think they probably were angry at him, saying, what in the world has happened to you? You know, you you used to be right in here with us, doing the same things we are on that night. Out here comes us all kinds of trouble, man. You, you're just, you become a, a bird our saddle here. We, we don't need your help anymore. We need to get you with it, you know? Well, and that's the appeal he makes to the mob, isn't it? He says, I was there where you are. I was with you. And, uh, and that's why I think in some of this, Paul has been surprised. I know we, bit. we probably doctor filled this to death. Right? <laughs> I, I think that I even read verse 5. If you, you know, he said, I did not know, brother, that he was the high priest. Yeah, he could even, we, we have no idea of the tone or anything or the relationship there. He could be being sarcastic, you know, in the sense of, to Paul, I, if I'm Paul, I don't recognize him as the high priest. You know, I can see it further. But what do you mean you don't? You didn't know. 
scriptures that you just get a perspective on, and sometimes we have the benefit of other passages to clarify it for us. In this case, we don't, but it, it, to me, it doesn't necessarily mean that Paul didn't really know. Uh, there's a lot that's communicated in tone and everything else. But, uh, anyway. Yeah, I hate I messed up that Caiaphas stuff. I don't know why I did that, so I apologize again about that. Well, when Paul's been gone, which if I had thought more clearly, I would have thought that through. So it's, you got this going on, and the intention is not coming down. And that's what we see in the next verses. Going to verse 6. Now when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council. Now, all this is going on, and you kind of have this term, you know, this argument going on at the front. And Paul's looking around. And he, he noticed... I don't know, was it recalled? Does the Holy Spirit remind him, hey, you got Sadducees and Pharisees here. Do you remember what they're in conflict about? But, but he, he cries out, Brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of a Pharisee. It is with respect to the hope and the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial. Okay, that's important. Why? This is the big... The, the big argument between Sadducees and Pharisees. Why were there more Pharisees who came to Paul or came to Christ, I'm sorry, than there were Sadducees? I believe it's over this one issue. Um, and, and so he says, I am a, I'm a Pharisee and I'm on trial because of, of, of the resurrection um, of the whole, I'm sorry, to the hope and the resurrection of the dead, right? So, um, before we get into verse 7, you remember what, what the disagreement was on. So Pharisees believed in the spirit world. They believed in angels. They believed in the possibility of resurrection. They believed in not just the materialistic world that you see around you, but they believed in all those spiritual things. They believed a man had a soul and a spirit. Sadducees were the opposite. They were very materialistic. They saw the world as finite, as, as what you see is what there is. Right? They didn't believe in, in, in angels. They didn't believe in, in a resurrection because they didn't believe in a spirit. And so you, you have two really different uh, intellectual minds. It's almost like you have creationists versus evolutionists. It's kind of the same mindset coming together here. Um, um, and, and so, verse 7, when he had said this, it had the effect, a dissension arose, so the, he's the, the, uh, the attention is deflected off of him, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, nor angel, nor spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. Then a great clamor arose, and some of the Pharisees, now notice this, some of the scribes of the Pharisees' party stood up and contended sharply. Now what did they contend about? We find nothing wrong in this man. What if a spirit or an angel spoke to him? That was a quick change, wasn't it? They're over there defending him now. Of course, they're not really, but...
not any different today. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I just think we all need to be so careful about what we're fed mentally, what we're told, what we're, whether it's about creation, whether it's about evolution, whether it's about anything, and how we get hooked as human beings. We have to think for ourselves and be more level-headed um, around all issues. Groupthink is dangerous. And as human beings, especially when, when we get into groupthink, we become very manipulative, moldable, or easily manipulated. Right? And so you have, like, like Patrick points out here, these are the intellectual people of the Jewish people, right? These are the people who study, who read, who think, are supposed to think deeply about all these things. And, um, and, and yet, they are so easily manipulated. Uh, and, and so you, this, um, this just becomes more intense as we go on. Uh, you go on to verse 10. And when the dissension, and notice this, when the dissension became violent, now what does that indicate to us? And it's physical at this point. The idea is violent. For something to be violent, what, is, what actually has to occur? Violence. Right? You wouldn't say a mob who yelled at each other were violent unless they were doing something to be violent, would we? The tribe, uh, when it became uh, violent, the tribune, afraid that Paul, notice this, would be torn to pieces by them commanded the soldiers to go down and take him away from among them by force and bring them to the barracks. I think it's also interesting here too. With the mob and at other times, Paul tried to reason with them. Does he try to use a lot of reason with the Sanhedrin? He didn't. He just kind of, he got things to move on. Uh, maybe it's inspiration of the Holy Spirit or maybe Paul's looking out and he can just reason this out but for some reason he decides this is not the time and so um, uh, he um, th this tremendous argument, dissension arises and so it forces the, the uh, tribune to take him into the barracks and to again imprison him uh, there and then we go on down to verse 11. The following night, okay, so think of what's going on. Now, put yourself for just a moment, as best we can, in the place of Paul. Does Paul know the ultimate end that God has for him? He did. He doesn't. And we've seen that indicated over and over again. Um, he, when he left to go into Jerusalem, what did he tell the people, the, the church, when they tried to get him to not go? He says, what are you doing to me? I'm ready to go, and I'm ready to, uh, I'm paraphrasing, but I'm willing to do anything. I'm willing to die in Jerusalem, which to me indicates Paul doesn't really know what's going to happen in Jerusalem. And here he is in this moment, and he's seen all this going on. I wonder if Paul wonders, am I going to get out of this alive? Um, to yes, go ma back to the last few verses, I got the impression that there was already some, some problems, even in their speech. So that may have been one of the reasons why he wasn't as apt to reason with them this time as he was before. Because even in their speech with Ananias and himself, it just seemed very tense. Yeah. Yeah. And there is a huge amount of tension going on. And so you're there, you're Paul, you're in prison. You've already been beat up. By the way, you might remember that. He was beat up earlier. I'm sure he's got bruising and cuts and all these things on him. 
Uh, he's a tired man, I'm sure, at this point. He's, and all that weight is on him. The following night, the Lord stood by him. That's an interesting phrase, isn't it? Not the angel of the Lord. The text says the Lord stood by him and said, Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. Now, I read that again. The following night, the Lord, not the angel of the Lord. God used angels, hasn't he? He used angels to free Peter from prison. He's used angels at various times. But this text says, Luke says, the Lord stood by him. Take courage. How afraid do you think Paul was? Paul's a courageous man, I have no doubt. But courage does not mean you're not afraid. And I bet Paul was very afraid. And I can only imagine, here he is, sitting there alone. He doesn't have the, his people around him. He's alone. He's hurting. He may be hungry. He's tired. And God says, take courage. And so it's with that that you go on into the next section here um, where, where the Jews are going to plot, not just react in anger, but plot to kill Paul, verses 12 and following. What time is it? I don't have enough time to dig into this. We've got one minute. But any other questions or comments, next time we're together, we'll jump into chapter uh, 23, 12. I'm sorry we didn't get further. I intended to get a lot further. But good discussion.